This afternoon, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, essay writing a little bit. Uh, now, when I'm saying we're, we're talking about building a solid staircase to essay writing, uh, it's actually sort of, I'm talking about a link. Um, when we're teaching young learners to write, uh, they can't usually make that big jump from sentences to paragraphs to essays. Uh, and, and I know that a, a lot of hagwans and, and, and schools are really pushing students to, to do more, to write more, uh, and usually that just sort of stresses them out. Uh, and so today we're not going to be talking about uh, topic sentences with main ideas and, and controlling ideas. Uh, we're not going to be talking about you know, different uh, patterns of grammar or the collocations that, that we need to write well. Yes, these things are important. Certainly they're important. Uh, but really what we want to do is we want to ease our children into the process of writing. And so today, this is what we're going to sort of look at. Uh, we're going to begin by focusing on what kind of writing is familiar uh, with our students already. Because it's with that writing that we need to begin them on that process. And then we're going to start looking at things that are less familiar to them. Uh, less familiar things would be things like paragraphs and essays. Uh, familiar writing would be things like uh, emails or, or perhaps stories that they've read uh, and enjoyed uh, as they've been growing up. And so uh, with that sort of introduction, let's take a look at the, uh, the sort of the outline uh, that I have in mind for today. Uh, we're going to begin uh, with sort of a, some experiential learning. Uh, I'm going to do a little mini lesson with you, uh, and it's called uh, a life map. And then after we do this little mini lesson, I'm going to then uh, sort of talk about what I did and sort of why. Uh, because uh, writing, as you probably know, is the last of the four skills to be developed. Uh, I'm sure most of you are aware of sort of the, the, the natural approach. And, and the idea is, of course, listening comes before speaking. Speaking comes before reading and reading comes before writing. And so oftentimes we're in such a hurry uh, with, our, with our learners that we, we try to skip steps. Uh, and that's not helpful to them uh, and it's very stressful on you because they're not ready to do uh, what you want. And so we're gonna spend a little time uh, looking at the reading and writing connection. That's most of my, my presentation. There will be a little time to talk about, hopefully, uh, if all goes according to plan, a, a little time to talk about revising and editing uh, and some of the things that I've done. Because uh, when I've done these uh, talks in the past, teachers are always asking, oh, how do we do that revising, especially peer, peer editing? How do we do that? What do we want our students to look for? Uh, I don't have any easy answers for you because obviously this is something that you need to develop with your, with your students. Uh, I've found that almost every class has their own, own way of going about the, the revising and editing process. Uh, but I'll talk to you about some of the things that I've done with some of my classes uh, to give you some ideas about where to start. Uh, and then there'll be hopefully some time for questions and answers. And I'll leave you with uh, my contact information and my website. Uh, now, I'm still building it. Uh, I'm going to make a lot of resources available to you there because I don't really know where in the writing process you are and, and sort of what kind of teaching uh, and writing development that you're doing. And so I'll try to make some of the resources that I've used over the years available to you. Okay. Let's get started. Okay, today's mini lesson. Like I said, it's, a, it's the life map. And so a life map is obviously about a student's life. What, do our, what are our students most familiar with? Well, they're most familiar with themselves. Uh, and a good writer is always drawing on his own experiences uh, to sort of inform his or her writing. And so, if you are going to be teaching your students writing, you, you need to get them involved with thinking about themselves, getting their ideas down on paper. Uh, and this is a fun thing that I've done with, 
uh, both young students and older students. Uh, and so one of the things that I would like you to think about today is the way I'm doing it with you, it's more for older learners. Uh, because you're all much older than the, uh, the, uh, the children that we teach. And so obviously the way I'm setting it up today is for you. And so if you are going to use this activity uh, with younger learners, one of the things that we need to think about is how could we adapt this so that it would work with younger learners? Uh, and we'll talk about that after I do the mini lesson. Okay, now before we get started, uh, hopefully, uh, you don't, aren't too shy about talking to your, your partner because uh, the first thing I need you to do is sort of to find a partner, someone to talk to because I got two questions for you today that I want you to sort of talk about before we get started. One, what are some important events in your own life? And take a moment there, just think quickly. What are some important things? Try to think about four or five things that are really important to you. And then think back, which of those experiences have made a difference in your life? Okay, take 30 seconds. Okay, now with someone next to you, I'll give you about two minutes, so one minute each. Uh, quickly share uh, some of those important events, some of those experiences that have made a difference. Okay, so hopefully this is, has awakened some memories because uh, the next step uh, is we need to go through the process of making our own life map. And what is a life map? Well, it's your life on a nice winding road. Uh, and obviously this is a this is a pretty well-developed life map and we're not going to be making anything like this uh, today because uh, we, we're only doing it very briefly to give you a taste of the activity. Uh, but as you can see, this particular student has sort of illustrated you know, everything that he or she can remember uh, in his or her life. Uh, and so how did she go about making this? Well, the first thing is, is you got to do some brainstorming. You've, you've had a chance to awaken some memories. Now, find some space on your, uh, in, your, uh, in your notebook or in the uh, handout that you have here uh, and think about some different things that have happened to you. Uh, think about things that are important to you. For me, being born, very important. <laughs> if I wasn't born, I wouldn't be here. Uh, then, of course, there's the interesting and exciting events that maybe you've had, like traveling to Egypt or, or other different places. Obviously, we've all experienced sadness, and we should probably remember those as well. For example, I remember when my father died. And then, of course, there's things that are sort of scary, uh, like when I fell into the hornet's nest and almost died. Uh, and then, of course, there's fun things like the night climb of Soraksan and watching the sunrise over the East Sea. And then, of course, there's embarrassing things. Uh, also kind of funny, but uh, more to you than to me. And that's, of course, teaching with your zipper down. <clears throat> and so take a few moments and, uh, and make a list of some of the things that have happened to you. Again, I'll give you about two minutes to do this. Okay, again, your two minutes are up. And so, obviously, the first step is getting some ideas on paper. Now, one thing that I've noticed about uh, a lot of Korean learners is that, especially young learners, their lives are very, very similar. Uh, and usually what, what stops them on, on making a list uh, 
isn't their experiences, it's their vocabulary knowledge. Uh, and so usually what I would do uh, after I've had my students make a list is I would usually have them share their list with, with a group of people. Three or four people is usually good for this. Uh, and so uh, I would just get them talking. And notice, I, I would give them a, a little bit of guidance on how to ask and answer some questions here. Because uh, if you want, especially young children, to talk in your class, you should probably give them the language to do it. And obviously one of the things that I would do is I would say something like, okay, you're A, okay, all of you are A, uh, and I'm B. And so, are you ready for this? So when I say go, you're going to ask me this question. Okay, three, two, one, go. Yeah, okay. And so it'd be nice, I should have told you what to say there. Uh, and so, what are my fun experiences? I might say something like, oh, uh, uh, one of my fun experiences was uh, the night climb of Sorak-san. Uh, that, that was actually the night that I, I met my future wife. Mm. <laughs> and so, of course, we take turns and go on and, and sort of do this. Now, again, uh, there's a lot of us here, uh, and, and it's kind of hard to make groups of four. Uh, so, obviously, you'd give them some time, probably about eight to ten minutes, uh, to let them have enough time to share uh, all their different experiences. And then, of course, after they've had a time to talk about this, tell them, add to their list. Uh, because they will have remembered they will say, uh, some things that have happened to them. Most likely, they heard the correct English and now can write it down. Uh, but either way, uh, whether they're remembering or getting the English, uh, letting them share and sort of, uh, you know, get some information from each other is helpful. It also makes them a little bit safer about sharing stuff later. Okay, and so, and add to your list. All right, once we've got a list of different types of events, now, a lot of these events are not in order uh, because they've been talking about them, they've been adding them out of sequence. Uh, step two to making a life map is to take a look at your list uh, and then put it into the right sequential order. And so, usually I have them count the number of events they have. Okay, I have nine or so, and so I'd write one through nine on my paper. Uh, and then I take a couple of minutes uh, to sort of put those into the right order. Obviously being born is first, and then moving and changing schools, falling into a hornet's nest, and then we can sort of go through uh, the whole list if you want, but I'm not going to, because uh, you can read it very easily. And so take a look at your list very quickly. Again, I'm going to give you a you're much older than the children, so I'll give you about a minute. Just quickly sort of put those, uh, those items on your list in the correct uh, time order. So what happened first, second, third. So what happens first? Uh -huh. So I was born. Yeah. And then second, uh, I moved and I had to change schools when I was in kindergarten. Yes. Okay. Your minute is up. All right, once we have everything in the correct order, the last step is to now make the life map. Uh, usually I would have my students do this sort of as homework. Uh, I would kind of get them started, uh, but I would leave the, the sort of the finishing up for, for homework. Uh, a nice big blank sheet of A4 paper would be passed out. And then I'd make sure that my students draw sort of a wavy or curvy line on the paper. Uh, and then they should make one dot for each event. Pretty simple. And then after they've put a dot for each event, uh, I tell them to give that a title. But the title should be very short. Uh, maybe one to four words. Again, they only need to know what's on the life map. When I look at the life map, I don't have to understand it. The life map is just for the learners themselves. Uh, and so they would label it. So I usually model this on, on the whiteboard for them. So uh, I would write born, uh, moved, 
Uh, so I would show just, I use one word for each of the, of the different events. And then I would draw a couple of pictures for them, and I'm no artist. If anyone has uh, ever had me in a class, uh, they can, they can uh, vouch that I can't draw. Uh, but I would, I would model it for my students to let them know that the art doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, but they should draw, try to draw a, a little picture for each event. And then, of course, uh, I'd get them started uh, on it, uh, let them illustrate one or two uh, of the different events, and I say, okay, uh, bring this in, you know, tomorrow, uh, and, and we'll, you know, we'll take a look at it from there. Uh, and they usually have a good time doing this, because they've spent some time in class talking about it, uh, they're kind of interested in seeing, you know, what others will draw. Uh, and it's, it's a fun little homework, and it doesn't require too much English. Uh, but to let them draw it into class would take quite a bit of time. Uh, and so it works better as homework. Okay, and so this is the life map activity. Okay, now let's talk about this life map activity. Why? Why do we, why do we want to use this? Well, one of the things that I've already told you about is that skill development proceeds in a certain order. Listening before speaking, speaking before reading, reading before writing. And so, what was the skill focus of this life map activity? Was it writing or was it more about speaking and listening? There was some writing involved, mostly list making. But the predominant skill, where you spent most of your time in the lesson was actually yeah, speaking and listening. Again, that's the na I know this sounds kind of weird, but that's where we start when we want to get people writing. First, we have to get them talking about ideas. They have to be comfortable with the ideas that they're going to be expressing in writing. Once they've got some language, usually developed through speaking and listening, then we can worry about them uh, to get going uh, with the writing. Obviously, they've collected a lot of this information already for them. The life map activity is actually sort of a, a sort of a pre-writing activity uh, in which you sort of devote time where they get to speak and listen to each other about different life events. And again, this is about vocabulary building. Uh, because one of the things that students often struggle with when you ask them to write is they don't have the vocabulary necessar necessary to develop the topic. But if you spend some time letting them talk to others about that topic, then the vocabulary development occurs naturally. Obviously, you don't know, you have some general idea of what happens in your, in your, in your students' lives. Uh, but you often can't prepare them for all the vocabulary that they need. And so vocabulary learning, a lot of times, especially for young learners, is about knowing the vocabulary they need to talk about themselves. And so, again, this helps them to develop the vocabulary they need without any direct instruction from you. So it saves you a little bit of in-class time. Okay. Now. There are two types of skills, and this is kind of important. We've got receptive skills and productive skills. And so, what are the two receptive skills? Listening and reading. Okay. And the two productive skills? Speaking and writing. Okay. And so, this of course, was receptive mostly or productive mostly? Well, think about it. Did the students produce something? Yeah. Yes. So it must have been productive. Yeah. And it was a mixture of speaking and writing, but most of the time was, was spent actually speaking. And writing was sort of confined to just sort of uh, short sentences, phrases, and words. Okay. Now, the title of this mini-activity was, call, of course, called a life map. And so can we use 
uh, this activity as described with young learners, especially uh, middle elementary school students or younger. Why or why not? Now I'll tell you right now that it doesn't work very well with, with elementary school students. Uh, and that has to do with this idea of life. Um, elementary school kids, they just don't have much of a life. Uh, the second thing that's going on there is actually has to do with cognitive development. Um, the idea of time for younger learners is not the same uh, as for us. A good example would be, would be my son. He's, he's five years old. Uh, when I say the word soon, soon means just after now. <laughs> and so he'll come to me and say, Daddy, can I watch a TV? Yes, son, you can do it soon, but not right now. You know, 30 seconds go by and, oh, can I watch now? <laughs> uh, and so, obviously, life is very abstract. It's very vague. Uh, and so that's hard for, for most elementary school students to, to put their head around. And so, what do we need to do? Well, if we're going to use this activity, uh, we need to make the time frame a lot more specific. And so there's a couple of ways that you can sort of adapt this activity uh, to make it more appealing and easier uh, for, your, for your elementary school students. Uh, obviously, it'll depend a part on their language ability. Uh, but one thing that even kindergarten students can do is they can do their, their, their daily life. They can make a map of their daily life. And so here it's simple present tense, and you know, uh, I get up at seven, uh, I eat breakfast, okay. And so they can make a life of their daily lives. Again, it depends on the level of your students. Higher level students, uh, you could probably get them doing their weekend map, or their summer or winter vacation map. Um, again, this will require them to know past tense, uh, and before, after, those type, types of language would also be helpful here uh, for them to develop a, a good, well-written paragraph or something. Uh, with very high-level students, you could get them thinking about their futures. They could make a future map or a dream map, if you will. Uh, again, uh, these learners need to be a little bit uh, higher level because that, that requires hypothetical uh, type of language, if, then, uh, will, would, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so there's a couple of things in play about making or adapting uh, this type of activity. One, how, how cognitively developed in terms of time are your students? Are they still thinking very concretely? If so, then be very specific about the time that you want them uh, to sort of map out. Uh, if they're older, uh, upper, upper elementary or middle school students, and they have the linguistic ability to, to do hypothetical situations, then yeah, you can get them uh, planning out their future and making a future map. Okay. Now, how can we use this activity to build various skills? Oh, it's pretty easy. Uh, once, once you have this sort of life map as a, or, or this mapping type uh, activity uh, in your repertoire of, of, of things that you do with your students, uh, you can easily adapt it to many different skills. Uh, a good example would be, okay, your students are, are listening to someone talk about what happened them, you know, they're talking to a friend about what happened to them today. So they're listening to a, a conversation between two people. But to organize what's being said, they can listen to that conversation and make you know, a map of what happened uh, to this one person. They could also do something very similar with reading. Uh, I know that when I was teaching, wow, uh, at SLP uh, 15 years ago, uh, I, had a, I had a middle school class uh, and we were reading uh, biographies of of people like Mozart, or Benjamin Franklin, uh, Madame Curie. Uh, and my students were having a really hard time uh, understanding uh, those particular texts because there's just, there was a lot of information, a lot of facts. 
Uh, and so I said, okay, don't try to understand everything. I would like you to, to sort of pick what you think is the most important experiences from these people's lives and then sort of make a life map for them. Oh, you mean like we did? Yes, just like we did on the first day of class. But now you're going to make one for Mozart. You're going to make one for Benjamin Franklin. And so it was much easier. Did they have to try to pick out everything about these people's lives in that reading? No. They just chose what was most important. And so reading naturally led to speaking, because I had them present uh, their life maps in groups. Uh, and then, of course, they use the life map to develop summary skills. Because, after all, a summary is to choose the most important things and, and then organize them sort of very uh, clearly and succinct succinctly. Uh, and so we went from reading to producing a, a, a sort of a life map of Madame Curie to building a summary. And so this activity can be linked to, to many, many different skills. Uh, it is, after all, sort of a graphic organizer. Okay. And so, what is the connection between reading and writing? Well, you've already sort of seen uh, a little bit uh, of what's going on here. Uh, I, I told you already that I've, that I've used a similar type activity like the life map uh, with, my, with my young learners to help them develop summary skills. Uh, and so, Really, the connection between reading and writing is reading provides us with the models uh, that we want our students to use. Um, and so we have to be very clear uh, about what, what readings we have our, our students, what, what readings we pick to have our, our students read. Uh, and to sort of help us pick uh, the correct type of, of reading, we need to think about uh, genre. And what, what do I mean when I say genre? Hmm? Yeah, it's a kind, a kind of writing. And so why is genre important to writing? Well, genre actually provides the template. It provides a way of organizing the information in a text. So yeah, let's take a look at something that we're probably all familiar with. We've got fairy tales, we've got fables, and we've got folk tales. Are they the same or are they different? Hmm, similar, <laughs> but, but not the same. Well, let's take a look at a fable. Do we usually have people or animals in fables? Yes, animals. Hmm, fairy tales. Could be people or animals. But, but how is the problem usually overcome in a fairy tale? Think about Cinderella. How did she get to the ball? Fairy godmother, that's right. And so fairy tales usually involve magic. Magic solves the problem. What about folk tales then? Folk tales, are there animals or people in folk tales? Usually the main characters are, are people. Uh, sometimes the, the, the evil element, the, the antagonist, can be an animal, uh, as a tiger or something like that. Uh, uh, but how does the uh, problem usually be overcome? Is it overcome with magic or usually through outsmarting uh, the evil or the antagonist? Yeah, outsmarting. And so, here we've got three very similar stories, but they are three distinct genres. Why? Because different information is needed for the student to write uh, those types of stories. And so before we can teach them how to write academic, th academic writing, we should probably introduce them to things that they're more familiar with like fairy tales, folk tales, uh, and fables. And now, what we need to do is, yes, they need to read and understand, but they also need to read and understand and notice the important elements. Because one of the things that students have a hard time with, especially with our academic writing, 
is they don't understand that a narrative is different than a description. An argumentative essay uh, is different than a, a narrative. Uh, all of these different types of academic writing are actually different genres. Uh, but no one's ever taken the time to help them develop that ability to notice what makes these different types of writing different. Uh, and it's actually pretty hard with academic writing. Uh, the, the things they need to notice are, are kind of very, very small, very technical details. So we should probably develop this awareness of genre with stories that they're more familiar with, such as fable, fairy tales, and folk tales. And of course, you want them to sort of read and compare and notice the differences. Notice that usually animals are in fables uh, and aren't the main characters uh, of folk tales and fairy tales. Fables are always teaching a lesson, uh, and the problem is sometimes not overcome. In the case of the rabbit and the tortoise, the rabbit should have won, but it's through his loss that we learn that, you know, slow and steady wins the race. Uh, and so these are all important elements uh, to developing a good fairy tale, fable, or folk tale. And so they need to sort of recognize uh, those elements before they can write one themselves. And that's also true of academic writing. They need to read that academic writing and they need to notice what makes it different, uh, what makes it, uh, what, how the information is sort of organized. Um, and so let's take a moment to talk about what genres your learners are most uh, familiar with. Uh, personal, academic, or creative genres. Well, let's take a look. I've got some uh, sort of, obviously this isn't everything. Uh, I couldn't fit all the different kinds of, of writing that we do on one slide. Um, but obviously, I've tried to organize this into personal, creative, and academic kinds of writing. And so, letters or emails would be personal. Invitations uh, are personal. Uh, to-do lists or notes to yourself are, of course, uh, very personal. And then, of course, forms. Uh, like being able to come here uh, and, and sort of attend this seminar probably required you to, to fill in some kind of registration form. Uh, these are all kinds of personal writing. Uh, obviously, uh, they're familiar with some of these and less familiar with others. Uh, most young learners are not familiar with filling out lots of forms. Uh, of course, the creative types of genre would be things like poetry, uh, different types of stories like ghost stories or adventure stories, uh, newspaper articles, but notice that there are also many different uh, uh, genres within a newspaper article. There's, there's movie reviews, there's, there's, there's opinion pieces. And then, of course, uh, advertisements are, can be fairly creative. Uh, whether it's a poster or, or an announcement for, for a new product. And then, of course, we've got the different types of academic writing, summaries, reports, uh, personal type essays such as narration or description, and then more academic type essays like uh, argumentation, compare, contrast, uh, process type writing. And so, obviously, which of these writings are your students most familiar with? Well, most likely it's personal and creative genres. They're, they're, they're least familiar with academic genres. And so, in the process of developing our students' writing, where should we start? Well, obviously we want to start with things that are most familiar with them. Uh, because it's easier for them to reproduce those genres. They know what's expected in a letter. They know the kind of information that they need to put in an invitation. Uh, they've probably gotten invitations where, oh my God, they didn't tell me the time. When am I supposed to come to this party? And you can talk about that. 
because uh, I've gotten invitations like that. <laughs> you know, of course, the person who's writing the invitation knows the time, uh, but simply forgets to put it on the invitation. And so these are things that we can look at as we're developing their writing. And again, this develops their ability to notice. Notice what's necessary for the genre to work and work well. And again, if you develop this skill with things that they're familiar with, they'll have that skill later when they need to look at writing that's less familiar with them, to them. Okay, I think there was one more question. I've got to go back for a second. Ah, yes. How do we develop uh, genre awareness? Um, usually, uh, I like to use storybooks. And uh, I've got a couple here that are good. Uh, for developing genre awareness. Uh, the first one that I have here is, of course, the true story of the three little pigs. And, and this, of course, requires a newspaper reporter to go and see uh, Big Bad Wolf in prison uh, and to get, of course, uh, his side of the story. And so there's a couple of different things that are going on here. Obviously, it's a story within a story. Uh, and so framed stories are very nice uh, for helping to develop uh, genre awareness uh, because we keep going in and, in and out of different genres. We've got the interview. We've got a little bit of narration. We've got excerpts from, from different types of uh, uh, newspaper writing. And so this is very nice. Uh, the other one that I like is uh, click, clack, moo, cows that type. And so this is fun too, uh, because in this story we have a farmer, and the farmer has a problem. He's got these cows that type. And now these, these cows, they want something from the farmer. So they keep sending him letters. <laughs> And then, of course, the farmer can't believe that his, his cows are typing. <laughs> cows that type? Who ever heard of such a thing? <sighs> and so he, of course, ignores their letters. And oh, they leave notices on the barn door. Notices such as, no milk. No milk? How can I run a farm if there's no milk? And of course, eventually, he decides that he he needs to write a letter to the cows. And again, it's a framed story. We've got, of course, the main plot line uh, with the farmer and his problem. But then inside the story, we've got two other types of writing. We've got letters such as, Dear Farmer Brown, the barn is very cold at night. We'd like some electric blankets. <laughs> Sincerely, the cows. Okay. And then we also have um, another type of writing. Sorry, we're closed. No milk today. <laughs> and so, is this a letter or is this a notice? notice. Yes, it's a notice. How did you know it was a notice and not a letter? No, dear, that's right, very nice. Okay, and so, obviously, how would I introduce this book? Well, I'd begin by just reading it to them, right? We always begin with reading to comprehend. And so, there's a general story. Uh, that I want them to know. I want them to enjoy this story. I want them to show me uh, that they understand the story and the problem. Okay, after they've read and understood the story, the next thing is to get them sort of noticing the target structure or, or organization that I want them to sort of be able to develop later. And you saw how I did that, right? I asked that question, oh, is this a notice or is this a letter? And so, very simple questions to get them to sort of to, to take note of something. And then, of course, oh, how did you know it was a notice and not a letter? Ah, no dear. Yes, exactly. Perfect. That's exactly what my, 
my young learners would say. Um, okay. Then we need to get them reading to clarify the target pattern or structure. And this usually requires us to bring in additional models. And sure, this is a wonderful letter. Um, right? We can use this letter. There's nothing wrong with this letter. Uh, but how many of your students are cows? Exactly. Do they have the same problems as a cow? Probably not. Uh, and so you probably want to bring in some additional models uh, of letters that they could write to someone. Uh, and from those, again, you can, you can compare them to the cow's letter uh, and you can get them to develop uh, and clarify what's needed in a good letter. And then obviously, after they've looked at some several different types of models, uh, we need to get them writing uh, their own. Uh, a good example is uh, something that I've done in the past is the story ends with this. The cows have a diving board. How did the cows get that diving board, I wonder? And so before we get there, of course, we, we let the, the students know that, hmm, Duck brought a letter from the cows uh, to Farmer Brown. And of course, this letter said, Dear Farmer Brown, we will exchange our typewriter for electric blankets. Leave them outside the barn door, and we will send Duck over with a typewriter. Sincerely, the cows. <laughs> and so, one thing I get them to imagine is, okay, what was the letter that Duck wrote with the typewriter? Hmm, how do you think it began? Dear Farmer Brown, excellent! <laughs> and so, of course, they write their, their letter, and then we compare it to the one that's in the book. Dear Farmer Brown, the pond is quite boring. We'd like a diving board. Sincerely, the ducks. Okay, and so this is the idea. Uh, if we need to develop different types of genres uh, with our students, we need to find fun and interesting ways to introduce them uh, to those different types of genres. Obviously, I'm sort of starting with, with familiar type writing. And then I would move to less familiar uh, type writing. Uh, and the idea is that, you know, once you've mastered something that you know well, you're ready to move on and try something that's a little bit more challenging. Uh, the whole idea of, of comprehensible input, I plus one, also applies to productive skills. Uh, it ha you have to have comprehensible output as well. And so you need to sort of guide your students through the development process. These sort of personal types of writing uh, come before more creative types of writing. Creative types of writing tend to come uh, before uh, more academic types of writing. Personal is easier than creative. Creative is a little bit easier than academic. Academic, of course, gets harder. And then, as we saw, summaries are probably the easiest. And then more academic essays like argumentation, process writing, uh, compare and contrast uh, are probably the most difficult. And always think about your sequencing. What do my students already know? How can I get, use that knowledge to help them develop uh, their English writing skills? OK. We've talked a little bit now about developing writing. Uh, one thing that we also need to talk about is writing also involves thinking. And, and this is less easy to, to develop, to develop in, our, in our students. Uh, oftentimes our students, especially if they're, if they're in English class, they don't want to think. <laughs> You know, they see sometimes English class is the perfect time to get a nap <laughs> or, or to socialize with their friends or something else. And so how can we get 
our students' thinking. What can we do to sort of to develop their thinking skills? Because good writing involves clear thinking. Well, there's a couple of different ways that we can get our students to develop uh, their thinking skills. Obviously, journaling uh, is one way. Now, journaling is different uh, than writing a diary entry. Uh, a diary and a journal are similar, but again, they're two different genres. And so a diary usually involves just your, your description of what happened and your feelings. But a journal requires not only the, to the description of events and a description of, of their feelings, but they also need to sort of interpret and analyze those events and those feelings. They have to ask questions like why and how. In a diary, you don't have to do that. In a diary, you're just saying, dear diary, this is how I feel. This is what happened. My day was really, really bad. And you don't need to ask yourself why or how it was bad. Uh, it doesn't re really require reflection. Journaling, on the other hand, does. Other ways to get your students sort of writing is, is cause and effect, what if scenarios. And, I, and I've got an example for you in a couple of slides. Problem solving is good. Uh, obviously, we want to introduce them to journaling uh, before we introduce them to problem, problem solving. Uh, journaling gets them thinking about their own problems thinking about their own experiences and trying to tease out what happened and why. A, a problem-solving writing usually requires them to, to sort of think about somebody else's problem. And it's hard to think about someone else's problem if you've never thought about your own. And so journaling needs to come before uh, problem-solving. And cause and effect, again, uh, needs to come before problem-solving because uh, most problems are set within a cause and effect sort of uh, uh, framework. Uh, drawing conclusions uh, is something also that students need to work on. And of course, this involves inference, being able to see the context and think a little bit beyond the context, to make connections between what's happening and what could or will happen. And then the final thing that you need to, to get them to develop is persuasive reasoning. Uh, actually, most children are really good at this. Children are really good at manipulating teachers and parents. Uh, they usually have this skill inborn, especially in their first language. Uh, the thing is, is they need to sort of work on developing uh, those skills in the second language. And again, a lot of this has to do with uh, uh, appropriate language development. Because um, usually when we, when we do persuasive reasoning, uh, we usually uh, work on developing our argument indirectly before we move on to a more uh, a direct uh, telling uh, of, our, of why we want someone to do something. Uh, and so, it's a little bit more complex and complicated than some of the others. OK, so um, let's take a look at, at journal writing a little bit more uh, concretely here. Um, journaling has to do with sort of personal experience. And when you write a journal entry, really you're asking your students to sort of move through this, this experiential learning cycle. First, they need to describe sort of what happened. Then they need to sort of ask those questions, uh, you know, why, how. Uh, and then, of course, they do need to take a look at their feelings. But they should look at their feelings after they've taken a look at the how and the why of the situation. Sometimes those raw feelings that we have when we sit down to write change a little bit uh, when we look at the situation more clearly. Maybe we'll discover that, oh, maybe I shouldn't have told my teacher the dress didn't look so good on her. <laughs> uh, and obviously, yes, a slip of the tongue can cause problems both for you and the person that you spoke to. And sometimes we don't see that it was actually 
what we said that set the, the chain of action in motion. We don't, really we don't really realize that until we've sat down and asked ourselves, why? Why did this happen? Okay, and so journaling should be about getting them to sort of think and reflect on their individual experiences. Okay, what if type writing? This is a fun, fun little prompt that I've used with, with upper elementary school students. You know, just ask them, what if all our streets were rivers? What would be different? Okay, you can brainstorm the, uh, the idea about, you know, boats rather than cars and stuff, but then draw their attention to some of the buildings. So, uh, where's the door? <laughs> what happens if the water goes down? Ooh, what happens if the water goes up? And so, the whole idea here is to get them thinking about the situation. We've got this lovely little uh, look here at this building, but we don't see a door. We've got some buildings on the side. I don't see any doors. We do have a boat tied up there, but I don't see any entrances. How are we getting into these buildings? And then in the background, there's some bridges. Where do those bridges go to? What are they connecting? And so, get them to try to imagine this before they start writing it. And they'll start to notice that, wow, there's actually quite a bit of problems here. And so, yeah, a lot would be different. And again, it's all about thinking, imagining. And yes, imagination is easy uh, when we're asking them to do creative writing. But imagination is also needed in academic writing. And these kinds of what-if thought experiments will help your students uh, develop that imagination that they need for, for more academic types of tasks. All right, I've pretty much come through uh, the main part of uh, what I want to talk to you about. Uh, the last sort of part of my, uh, uh, my talk today is about revising uh, and editing, because uh, Always, always when we're doing a, a sort of a, a writing intensive sort of uh, language program, uh, the writing part is actually easy. Uh, it's sitting down and actually reading everything uh, that your students have written and giving them the feedback that they need. Uh, that's really the most challenging aspect uh, of any sort of writing uh, course. Obviously, one of the things that we need to focus on uh, with our students is that always meaning and content should come before mechanics and structure. Uh, really sit down and try to understand what your student is trying to say. Because oftentimes the language and the meaning isn't matching correctly. They have a clear thing that they want to tell you, that they want to express. Uh, but their language just isn't there, isn't allowing them to say what they want. And so one of the things that you need to do is sit down with those problematic uh, sentences and say, so uh, do you mean this or are you trying to say that? And, and, and see if you can get them to, to show you which way they want their writing to go. Uh, because oftentimes a good example is students who don't have uh, good uh, feelings about certain types of grammar, they avoid the grammar. Uh, and so, uh, rather than using because, uh, they'll simply uh, use short, simple sentences. Um, instead of using before or after again, uh, they'll try to use short, simple sentences. Things like because, before, after, these words have a lot of meaning. And if you don't use them, it's really hard to understand what your writer is trying to say. Uh, and so before you grade the grammar, try to make sure that you understand what your student is trying to say. After you're sure about what they want to say, obviously just grading and correcting everything for them, that's not helping improve their ability to write. 
And so one of the things that you need to do is help your learners to develop the ability to sort of proofread on their own. Usually what I would do is, I usually would make, especially younger learners, I would tell them that they're going to have to write something three times. They're going to have a, a first draft, a second draft, and a final draft. And so the first draft is really about meaning. What, what, do my, what are my students trying to say? What, what, what do they want to tell me about this topic, uh, about this theme? The second one is, of course, about uh, getting them to notice their own problems. Once the meaning is clear, then we need to work on the mechanics and structure. And usually, I would use symbols uh, and underlines. So I don't tell them exactly what's wrong uh, with, with what they've written. But I would use special marks uh, and underline certain sections of text to get them to look more closely at what they've written. Uh, the idea there is, you know, hopefully they'll figure it out and fix it on their own. And then obviously, if learners are struggling uh, to identify uh, the problem, one thing that you hopefully have used is models. Again, reading before writing. Get them to go back to some of those models that they looked at. Oftentimes, when we have different types of writing, a good example is narrative. If we're telling a story, a story always has this sort of flow. What happens first? What happens next? So on and so forth. And so there's an awful lot of time markers. And so if your students are telling a story and they're having problems with, with verb tense uh, or, or signaling uh, when different things are happening, well, all that language is already used in your models. They have the correct form. It's there for them. So send them back to the model and say, oh, look, this sentence is very similar to this one here. What's different about them? Usually, that's when they notice, ah, and then they can go back and fix because they know that the sentence that's in the model is correct. And they can see how the model sentence and their sentence is different. And so the idea, especially with writing, uh, is to guide them to, make, uh, to take notice of, of what they're doing wrong. Of course, if they notice it, hopefully they'll remember it. In the future, the idea is that they won't do it again. If you're always correcting their papers for them, chances are they make the changes, but they don't think about it. And if they don't think about it, they don't learn it. Okay, and so obviously uh, the last thing you need to do is you get their final product, uh, and then you need to make them aware of the, of the small details and, and mistakes that they've made. Uh, one thing that I, I like to do is I like to introduce my, my students to abbreviated proofreading marks. Uh, there's lots of them out there. Uh, you can design your own system or you can use somebody else's system. Uh, usually I've always chosen to use someone else's system. Uh, hopefully because if, they, if I use someone else's system and they move on to another teacher, another teacher will use similar marks. Um, and so some of the common proofreader marks are things uh, like I'm showing you right here. Um, in Korean, sometimes I use the Chinese symbol day and the Chinese symbol so uh, for marking uh, upper and lowercase letters. Uh, but uh, you don't have to. Uh, the common marks are just three underlines under a letter that needs to be capitalized. Uh, a lowercase is just a slash through the, uh, through the capitalized letter. Um, and then there's these other marks that you can take a look at. Um, what this does is if you train your students in these proofreading marks, they get to used to seeing them on their papers from you, the teacher, but then they'll start using them uh, with their, uh, with their uh, classmates when you ask them to do peer editing. And again, Oftentimes, uh, peer editing can be done in a couple of different ways. Uh, sometimes uh, I ask a student to switch papers uh, with a student. Uh, I ask the students to sort of underline what they think might be wrong. And then that rough draft comes to me. 
and then I sort of go back and say yes or no uh, to whether or not it was correct or wrong. And then the next day, I get them together, and they look at both of their papers, right? Because they've, they've switched papers with each other. They've tried to guess what's wrong with each other's work. I take a look at it. Uh, I make my underlines and my marks. And then together, they work on correcting their errors. Uh, again, uh, with peer editing, um, try to make sure that you keep a couple of students together for a while. Don't always switch students. Students aren't really comfortable about sharing their work. Uh, and so if you sort of tell them that, ah, this month or for the next two months, you two are writing buddies. Uh, you're going to be doing a lot of work and reading each other's writing. And so know that they're going to have this writing buddy for a while. Uh, at first, they'll be sort of shy and they, they won't really uh, say much to each other and they'll still write very cautiously. Uh, but if they're together for a long period of time, after a while it's like, all right, you already know everything about me, so I might as well just write uh, what I think. Uh, and it takes a while for them to develop trust. Uh, and so try to keep your writing buddies together for at least a month, if not longer, if possible. Okay. Um, I've pretty much come to everything that I've wanted to say. Now, I am going to give you some Q&A, uh, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give you this, this website because uh, it's kind of hard to, to write down. Right now, this is not connected to anything. It's just sort of floating out there in cyberspace all by itself. Uh, and so uh, if you try to Google this, I don't think you'd find it because uh, I've... Uh, I've actually removed a lot of the, the, the key words from, the, uh, from the, the, the style sheet and stuff to help, to help locate it. Uh, the reason for that is because there's some uh, uh, copy written materials currently available uh, at this website. And, and so uh, I've not made whole books available to you, but uh, I've given examples of different types of, uh, of activities that you could do. Uh, and they've come from you know, uh, published uh, uh, materials from different, different uh, uh, publishers. And those publishers probably wouldn't be happy that I'm sharing them with you. Uh, so uh, I've sort of disconnected this from the, from the general uh, cyberspace. But you can go to it directly by, by typing in the address. Uh, right now, there's only a few things up there. But uh, I, I'm going to expand uh, what's made available. Uh, I'm just taking my time to cut out the, the most useful activities for you. Uh, so I, I'm not making whole books available, but I am making uh, a lot of materials available to you uh, for, for different types of genre awareness uh, and pre-writing activities uh, to help your students write. Okay, so uh, I'll leave this up there. Now uh, let's do the question and answer period. Are there any questions out there for me? Similar, but a little bit different because you want to contain... Um... Okay, so she wanted me to clarify a little bit about uh, the difference between uh, a diary and a journal. Okay, so let's think about uh, Albert Einstein. He was a scientist. And uh, Albert Einstein kept a journal. He didn't keep a diary. He, he actually found his days at the patent office extremely boring. And so he didn't really write about his life. He, he, write, he wrote about these thought experiments that he would dream up while he was trying not to be too bored with his work. Uh, and he kept a sort of note of these thought experiments in his journal. Uh, one of those uh, thought experiments was, OK, I am driving in a car. I am driving very fast, almost at the speed of light. I turn on my lights. What happens? And then he sort of described what he thought would happen. And then he took a look and thought about why that would happen. And actually, out of that thought experiment came the general theory of relativity. And so journaling is about thinking. Diaries are about describing your day and your feelings. 
And so journaling helps us become better writers. Diaries help us to remember uh, what we did and how we felt. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with a diary. Uh, but in terms of, of helping and pushing your students towards the ability to, to write academically, journaling is actually a, a better activity than just simply keeping a diary. Okay, if there's no other questions, well, thank you very much for coming. Oh, oh, somebody, a question. Have you finally noticed me? <laughs> Sorry. No, I was just going to ask you, do you have any ideas to help kids peer edit? Peer editing, okay. This is what we're trying to develop in our school. All right, yeah. Okay, second and third graders. Um, that's going to be tough. Um, one thing that, uh, again, uh, the idea is always uh, about meaning uh, rather than, uh, than the, the, the mechanics and the form. Especially with young learners at that age, uh, it's really more important about what they have to say than how they're saying it. Uh, the grammar that they're using, the misspellings, because if you think about learning to write in a first language, um, usually up through third grade, uh, teachers allow creative spelling, uh, meaning uh, first, second, and third grade native speaker teachers don't focus overly on how a student spells a word. Now, that doesn't mean they don't circle them. That doesn't mean that they don't have students go back and correct those misspellings. They do. Uh, but first, second, and, and third grade teachers usually in an L1 situation, the focus is always on meaning. Especially, did they say enough? Were you, did you give details? Did you provide examples? Uh, and so, hopefully, with that age student, you're going to be working more on meaning, uh, developing the ability to write very clearly with lots of detail. Uh, with fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, that's where I would say we start to make our switch to more form-focused type uh, peer editing activities. Uh, again, uh, one of the things that you need to do if you are going to develop something like this is you need to be aware of the common errors. Uh, and so, a good example, uh, uh, third person singular, uh, present perfect, right? Uh, subject verb agreement. Uh, students always forget the S. Uh, and so, that could be something that you could ask your students to do, uh, is to sort of look for specific errors when they're doing peer editing. Uh, it gives them something to focus on. Uh, then, as your students become better able to notice different types of grammar errors, uh, you can, of course, get them to notice uh, more and more aspects of the writing. Uh, yeah. Yeah, model. Model how to do it. Put some common mistakes up there and say, oh, last week when I was reading your journals, here were some, here were some sentences that I saw. And yeah, actually take sentences from their work, because uh, that tells them that you're actually reading it and you're looking at it. Uh, I know that when I was doing, re having students do journaling, I couldn't really uh, make comments, comments on everyone's journals. Now, I tried to read everyone's, and what I would do is try to notice bad sentences. And I would, I would write those bad sentences in a, in a notebook so that I could save them for later. And then students said, oh, I didn't think you read my journal, but that's my sentence. And I said, yes, it is. And now we're going to look at it. It's like, and then they realize, oh, I shouldn't have said that, because now they know I made a mistake. And yeah, there's, there's always fun things like that you can do. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's fun, but anyway, it's educational. <laughs> Okay, I've just gotten the, the stop signal. So uh, thank you very much for coming. It was my pleasure.